Hello, welcome to MySec Southfield. My name is Brett Hansen. I'm the Southfield director. Uh, if you're like MySec, you like to come to security events, we have several other meetings that meet throughout the month. We have MySec Jackson that meets the second Tuesday of the month, MySec Lansing in Detroit, which meets the second Wednesday, and MySec Southfield and Grand Rapids that meets the second Thursday of the month. There's also several other security groups in the Michigan area, IC, ISC Squared, North Oakland ISSA, Motor City ISSA, and Lansing ISSA. If you're interested in any of those groups, you don't have the information, come see me, I'll forward you the information. Uh, we're currently meeting at Town Square Food and Spirits. Please pass your thanks to the staff that have provided the room and great service. Uh, tonight has been absolutely wonderful to the, how they have accommodated us. Be part of MySec. If you have a topic for a talk, let me know because I'm always looking for talks, if you didn't know that. And if you'd like uh, to see a talk, let me know as far as a topic. We will try to find someone who can fill that gap for you and get something new onto the table. Uh, if you haven't already joined Slack, there's like 300, 400 people that are on there now. Almost if five. Almost five. Oh, this just changed. There is no longer a invite on the website. So if you want to join Slack, come see me or anybody else here that's on Slack, and we will get an invitation sent to you. So any interest in the Slack, if you're not already on there, I will see you after. <clears throat> I couldn't think of anything snarky to say. <laughs> totally lost it there, but yeah. Uh, announcements, MySec Social is uh, the last Thursday of the month, which is July 25th. We'll be meeting at Black Lotus Brewery in Clawson from 6.30 to 8.30. A new place, show up there, be cool, and have lots of fun. Uh, job postings, does anybody have any jobs they would like to advertise? Yes, sir. Uh, Price Waterhouse is looking for a Excellent. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is looking for security architects and security cloud architects and a security engineer. Uh, we're desperately looking, so if you have that skill set, please see me afterwards and would love to talk to you. Any others? Anybody seeking jobs? <laughs> Everyone from my company raised their hand. <laughs> uh, any other announcements? <laughs> No, all right, so we have uh, uh, the talk title is Do-It-Yourself Network IDS by Kent Gruber. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't sweat on that, did you? Not at all. <laughs> I don't want any. I want to sweat. Tears. <laughs> Good audio, hopefully, something. Cool. So yeah, hi, my name is Kent Groover. I go by PyCat online. I don't have any introduction slide. I just go right into the talk. Because um, I, I know most of you know me. I'm PyCat on the MySec Slack. Do uh, you want to know more about me? Come, come get me. So uh, we're going to talk about network packets. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about network-based intrusion detection systems. There's network-based intrusion detection systems, there's host-based intrusion detection systems. I'm sure there's more, but those are the two that I know. And uh, network-based intrusion detection systems are really around like the idea of a packet. And the packet is the basic unit of information that's transferred across the network, according to something I copied. And uh, packets are really cool because they got layers. And we're going to get a little bit more into like what are the layers of the packet and stuff like that. And so the packet layers, basically each layer has a different type of, uh, of header. Hopefully that just doesn't fall off me. But, um, they could have different types of headers. Uh, so for example, like Ethernet header, IP headers, or UDP headers. But the packet, like in its raw form, so to speak, is sort of just like this uh, array of unsigned U8 int, uh, UINT 8 uh, integers, essentially, which is like 0 through 256, which has a couple interesting properties that I'll show in a little bit. But uh, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to take these like series of bytes and we're going to map them into the appropriate data structure. And this is what tools like Wireshark and uh, other like protocol analyzers do for you, right? And we're going to try to leverage uh, like that functionality, but in a programmatic way. So uh, the packets that go over something called the network interface, and you probably have like more than one network interface. They're going to be virtual network interfaces. They're usually backed by actual like a physical network interface. Um, and you know, they have different properties. Like sometimes you can set them in monitor mode, and other times you can't set them in monitor mode. So just interesting there, they go off across some physical medium, but we're going to kind of ignore that. And we're going to focus on really the programmatic interaction of how do we like manage wrangling these packets to actually do an intrusion detection system-like thing, right? Um, 
So just like real quick though, like on a low level of how like I would actually like start capturing packets. I'm gonna like look at real fast Linux and then a Mac OS, which is basically just BSD uh, version of how do I actually start capturing these raw, uh, you know, bytes. So uh, just for an example, this is uh, these are gonna be Ruby examples, but it's gonna be very similar in like Python or any other programming language really. Um, so we're gonna have we're gonna grab the default interface, and this is uh, just using kind of uh, this library just to grab the default network interface. Um, then I'm gonna create a socket. I'm gonna do this weird like PF packet thing, the sock raw thing, and I'm gonna pass in this 0x30 underscore 00. Copy that offline, I have no idea what that means. But what I do know, <laughs> <laughs> but what I do know is that this helps me start capturing uh, raw packets, essentially, the raw bytes uh, from essentially the socket, which I call a file, because everything really is a file. Um, same sort of thing in Mac OS, but a little di different, right? So I'm gonna grab the default interface, but then I have to do this weird like dir glob thing to grab this, uh, what is it, dev BPF device. So on Mac OS you have all these special files called dev BPF. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter, um, which is just it's something I'm not really gonna get into, but uh, it's basically a way to filter out those bytes that are coming through uh, that network interface, or that programmatic network interface essentially. But uh, what I can do is I can do all these like IO octals and then set like the interface that I want to deal with. Maybe I want to say I want to do it immediately and I can set a timeout and then I can do a buffer size. So it looks very similar. It's not exactly the same, obviously it's a different operating system. But uh, these are just kind of like annoying to work with really. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna kind of ignore that and most people end up working with something called libpcap. Um, they don't even end up really working directly with libpcap. So basically you have these wrappers to that library. This is one wrapper that I wrote in a programming language called Crystal that interacts directly with that C-based libpcap API. Um, but it provides this nice actual like Ruby-like syntax to actually like manage the capturing, which I show like a basic usage at the bottom. Um, and again, this is interacting directly with that C API. And Crystal is a great language actually because it's almost like doing a direct call to the C API. There's no like weird like uh, like language boundaries that you have to deal with in something like from Python to C or Ruby to C and deal with that. Uh, this is like talking directly to the C API, which is like kind of an, a very interesting feature of the language. Um, but you, you don't really want to work with the C there. Uh, oh, and then uh, libpcap, you have the winpcap, the N, uh, ncap, which are basically the Windows variants. Winpcap has been depreciated. You'll go find the website. It says don't use it, use ncap, or ncap. I think it's ncap, I forgot the pcap and the ncap part. I don't know, but that's fine. <laughs> it talks to the Windows version of that whole socket thing, so you don't have to. And the two languages that I'm really gonna like focus on tonight for building this IDS are gonna be uh, Go and Ruby. We're gonna use Go Packet for Go, and we're gonna use Packagen for Ruby. We're gonna kinda see how do I build this IDS. That's the same we're gonna do. Um, just a real quick like intro to Packagen. Packagen, you can parse like the raw packet, you can grab the headers out of it, and then you can do like interesting things like do this like dot ethernet dot source at the bottom to actually access all the information that's inside of the packet in a very nice, you know, programmatic way, right? So um, the Packagen uh, library is a fantastic library. In my opinion, it's one of the best packet analysis libraries, or just like even just like code bases for understanding how that whole byte order mapping I was talking about works. Um, it has some of the best documentation in any API that I've ever, or like a, uh, any library that I've ever used, and uh, it's basically built by one guy. Um, his name is Sylvian Daubert, and he is fantastic. He's literally just some dude, I, I really don't know him, but he's just some dude in France. Um, and he's awesome. And then I've contributed just like the HTTP parser and I've done like a very uh, minimal things to kind of help him out, but he is just amazing. Um, so just like, just, honestly, just so good. Like so good, like I've learned so much. Like I, I can't, I've actually emailed him like three times, like I love him. <laughs> anyway. So, yes, yes, 100%. Once my French lover gets back to me, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, and then uh, Go Packet, right? So Go Packet, it's very similar to Packagen, but it's in Go. And so it has a bunch of other actually interesting features. Uh, for example, you can like do the layers part and get the layers out of the packet, which is nice. And then you can also work with libpcap, or you can use pfring or af packet, which was that whole uh, Linux version of talking to the raw sockets. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can programmatically grab these packets, and Go, pack, uh, Go Packet makes it really nice. And then more specifically, uh, the TCP stream assembly is a really fantastic feature, but I'm not gonna really get into TCP stream uh, reassembly. Um, 
So to use that API, you'd make something like, I'm gonna make an ethernet decoder to start with, because all my packets are gonna be ethernet packets, and then I'm gonna create uh, just like this like little uh, layer type, a slice that's gonna be upwards of 10 layers, and then I'm gonna decode a raw packet into that uh, slice of layer types, and then I can like iterate over it and print out like what layer type that it is. That's just, just getting you intro introduced in how these kinds of libraries work, and they're very similar, right? You, you get the packet off the wire, you do with the parsing that you're not gonna have to actually like do the manual byte order mapping. Someone already wrote the library to do that for you. And then you're gonna have to you know, figure out how to deal with that. And we're gonna build an IDS on top of this. And then basically, so this is the idea, right? So if packet has bad intentions, this is a bad packet, else it's packet is good, right? Obviously we're gonna have to like actually write if that thing has bad intentions. We're gonna have to write the code to be able to figure that out. But that's gonna be very like specific um, to like your use case. Like I could give you a whole bunch of rules um, and they may not apply to your organization whatsoever. And you can find that if you go download like a whole bunch of like community snort rules. You're gonna have to tune that out to actually like make it applicable to your environment. Otherwise you're gonna be wasting a bunch of CPU time for no reason. So I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly how you're gonna you should, how you should tune your rules, but that's something, there's a lot of reading on that you can do that I recommend you do when you're either deploying an IDS, uh, deploying any IDS rules. So let's build that engine I was talking about. Basically, we're gonna create register and evaluate some IDS rules. How does that work? Like how much code do I have to write, right? Oh, and then basically the IDS engine, that's gonna maintain, that's gonna have the ability to actually capture the packets and then under, the, and then we're gonna have actually the, the rules that we're gonna register into the engine and then it's gonna produce some sort of alert, right? Because it's not an intrusion prevention system, it's not gonna stop the bad guys from talking to your thing right now, it's just simply identifying that maybe something weird happened. But in reality, this doesn't even have to be just like looking for bad things, this could just be some sort of like packet instrumentation to maybe like build out stats or counters, get an idea of what traffic is actually flowing on your network, right? So this is the actual code that you, need, uh, uh, you can write to actually build a simple intrusion detection system in Ruby. So you require the package in library, uh, oops, I went too far, but anyway, I'm gonna go over how it works. And then you could register the rules like this. So I have a rule for TCP, I have a rule for DNS, and I have another rule for TCP. And they basically do all like very simple things, like checking if a TCP flag is set. Because um, TCP has these things, uh, flags. They all have these attributes that you may not know about them, but these libraries are gonna get you very familiar with them. Or if you open up Wireshark, you're gonna be able to go in there and see like what are the things that I can look for, right? So. I say I want a new IDS and then it does something, right? So it'll hit this initialize function, which is gonna do the dot new thing. And we're gonna ha have a argument that we can pass in called interface, it defaults the package and default interface, and then it takes in this thing called a block. It's gonna kind of ignore that, just sets the interface uh, variable, and then it still knows that block's there. Uh, but we're gonna create this hash, a key value pairing, where we're gonna have the key of the headers that we're gonna uh, be able to use, and then all of the uh, rules are gonna sit underneath that header, right? So now we're gonna instance eval the block that we passed in. What is the block? The block is all of that stuff underneath, uh, in that do and end, underneath the uh, IDS uh, new do. And we could register a rule TCP, rule DNS TCP, and how does that work? So it's gonna hit that, and it's gonna say, all right, I want a rule. And so it's got, like, awesome, I know how to register rules. Uh, what type of rule is it? It's header, and it has a block. Okay, whatever. Maybe you don't know what a block is, but it's gonna make a little bit more sense. But if the rule uh, exists, it's gonna put it in there. Otherwise, uh, it'll like make a new rule instance with an array. It'll hit DNS, it'll do the exact same thing, but putting DNS, TCP, exact same thing, but we're putting it back under TCP. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like, but then it's gonna actually go to the uh, packet capturing part. But what was that whole rule thing I, I was just talking about? It basically took all of those rules and then put them into this, again, key value pairing. So we have just two keys, TCP and DNS, because those are the only headers that we've written rules for, and then we have these procs, which are what the blocks were. These are basically uh, functions that we're gonna be able to call that are gonna do something on a packet, and we're gonna be able to pass them uh, to package end to do something. So that's what our rules are. Obviously, if we added ones for like DHCP, dot .11, they would be all their own keys and whatever rules you associate with them will be in that. So what happens? So PackageN does a capture on the interface that we passed into it and now it has something, it has a packet off the wire. It's gonna do something with each rule that we have assigned and it has the header and it has the blocks, which is the actual like logic that we're gonna run, right? So we're gonna check, is that packet even of that type of header? Otherwise, I'm not gonna run this rule. And then with all the blocks, that array of like functions that I have, I'm gonna call each one of them and I'm gonna pass in that packet. 
So I do the black call, and it goes here, and we'll hit the first rule, right, because we wrote a TCP rule. And we it goes in that packet, so that do packet, that's basically the function, it's gonna take in that packet, and it's gonna check. Is the TCP flag push set? Is the TCP flag act set? Otherwise, go to the next packet. Okay, well, those things are set. Now, how about, is the, does the packet body, does it contain the CGI bin PHF? Okay, yes, it does. And then we're gonna put that to the screen, and that's effectively the alert. It's just gonna print something to standard out. Again, we're keeping it very simple. We could write out to a file if we wanted to, but we could also just like take the standard out and write that to a file. But I'm just gonna, again, put the standard out. So, and then it's like, cool, well, I have another packet now. Let me go to the next rules, and it's gonna keep going until the circle of life ends. And that's, <laughs> And, and that's really like the, like the gist of this like whole IDS engine thing. I have some sort of packet instrumentation that can do like these kind of arbitrary functions with the packet. And those arbitrary functions would be written by you as the like person implementing the IDS engine or downloaded by you to put in your IDS engine. So I actually really released this as a, as a Ruby gem. It's called Capra and I call it a powerful intrusion detection system but you get to decide if powerful is the right word for that. And then we have gem install Capra to actually install it to use it, oh, what up? Oh no, oh no. All right, cool, capper in it. <laughs> uh, and then that'll create this new thing called the capper file. That capper file is just literally a Ruby file where you're gonna, dang it. Captain. <laughs> All right, all right, cool, stay. <laughs> So it's gonna have a capper file, which is just a Ruby file, but I called it a capper file. This is very simple, or something like a vagrant file, or a couple other uh, packages do something like this. But uh, you can also specify the interface at that, with that init command, and then the capper file just basically has just the default interface that you set, and then your rules will go underneath that. Oh, go the wrong way. Uh, I also uh, created a snort rule converter. So you can actually take a bunch of snort rules that you can download offline, and then convert them to capper file syntax. Uh, that was literally just like a really big function. It's like a super big function to do that. Uh, almost oh, 300 lines though. And then uh, to use it, you know, you can take your capper convert, you pass in the snort uh, command or a snort file, and then you can, you know, put that into your capper file. And then, um, bring, oh, come on, can't you figure out? And if you want to start the engine, uh, just do capper start. And it'll look at the capper file in your local directory and it'll actually run the engine rules. So capper files can do all sorts of interesting stuff, like I can have a, like a sugar method that says default interface to grab the default interface for you so you don't even have to specify it. Um, we can set a counter to zero, because we, this is just Ruby here, I can just set arbitrary variables. I can literally pull it in Metasploit code if I wanted to and run Metasploit code randomly for each packet. It's gonna make your idea slow. But you can do that just because it has a full-fledged programming language to do these things. Um, and then uh, I have this rule any, which is the sugar syntax, uh, syntactic sugar to do something for any type of packet. So I don't care if it's TCP, I don't care if it's dot eleven, I don't care whatever the heck it is. As long as it's parsable, I'm going to do something with. And the only thing I'm going to do, I'm not even going to like do anything interesting. I'm just going to like add to the counter. Um, and then you could do like more interesting things, like how about DNS, right? We could check if something's a DNS query or a DNS response, and just print out the information to the screen which is just interesting, again, packet instrumentation to be able to figure out like what rules do you even wanna like, uh, what rules can you even support on your network or do you even seeing uh, a whole bunch of like boot P or whatever the heck it is. Um, and then I said before that that property of that uh, uint8 array, right, it's just zero through 256 and like my terminal supports 256 color. So what's kind of interesting is that I can, for any packet, I can take the bytes from that packet um, and then literally just puts, uh, and then what you'll see this is like shell syntax essentially to be able to color the uh, like little block that I have there. And so if I were to do capra start, I could see just all of my packets, a giant rainbow. And I've done something similar to this before uh, in a project called Niji, and it was using that uh, libpcap uh, project, and then I just did the, almost the exact same thing. Um, but I just find this like really wonderful. And if we see like these like blue lines up here, essentially you can see like a couple stripes are just like this uh, like teal blue in there, right? That was me pinging out to Google. Um, and what's interesting is that you can see like some of them start to fade is because I'm experiencing like a crazy amount of packet loss at work. So like I don't, <laughs> like I'm literally dropping like 30% packets like all the time. I'm not sure what's going on. But you don't see like the 30% packet loss drop just because it's all just like one line, right? Um, so 
you can do also like more interesting things like how about just like a, like a stats, like give me the stats for all the traffic that I'm seeing, right? So I do something for any packet, I clear the screen, and then for each packet header that I see, I'm gonna add to the stats. Uh, it's just a key value pairing, but the initial value is zero. So I'm gonna add to that every time I see a type of header. And also you can stop me and ask questions at any time, by the way, if you're confused, uh, anything. Um, <laughs> just cause I know I'm maybe, yeah, what's up? Yeah, no worries. Uh, I would, maybe before you got in here, I said there was this fantastic library called PackageM, and I'm in love with the guy that made it. Like, I'm in love with the guy that made it. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just like, that allows me to do basically all of this, because I don't have to do any of the parsing or anything like that. And if I had any questions about the parsing, the actual code to read it is like this beautiful DSL. So it's just like, especially if you're a Ruby guy, it's one of the most beautiful libraries ever. Anyway, so I'm gonna print the, the stats, which is just using this block again, but instead I could just get like a histogram, right? So this is just like very interesting, powerful, I would argue, powerful tooling that I get to do with packets as I please. Arguably, you could do the same sort of thing with any other language, right? Or even just like uh, Wireshark, if you didn't know they have like a Lua scripting built in where you could do something like very similar to this. Um, but basically again, programmatically interacting with packets becomes actually very interesting and almost easy to build these kinds of systems. Um, and then this is just uh, the actual like command line application that I wrote to do those three commands, where it's just, I have command init, command start, and command convert. Um, uh, I don't show the actions because that's kind of irrelevant, but it's just a very simple workflow. I, I have three commands that I have to learn, three commands that I uh, need to like work with as an operator of this tool. And then uh, to provide some like extra functionality because it's Ruby, I can just literally monkey patch the package N library to add a whole bunch of syntactic sugar that does things like, for example, for any type of packet, check if it's a FTP type packet, which is very simple, just checking if the destination port or the source port is 21, which is the port associated with FTP, unless I'm wrong and I totally messed it up. But <laughs> we have uh, an echo reply, uh, which is just checking if the type is zero, within subnet where I take in a CIDR, I parse it, and then I check if that subnet uh, is included uh, for whatever uh, packet source or destination that I'm working with. So it's just kind of interesting that I'm able to extend the functionality of the package in library so easily, though some people might argue this is a fault of the language, which I understand. Oh, uh, so this is supposed to be a fun little demo. So we have up top, we're gonna have snort, and then here we're gonna have capra, and just to like, kind of just like, go over like, what's the speed like, and I'm gonna ping Google, and then over here I'm running an nmap scan on my network. So I start snort, I start capra, I ping Google, and we can kind of look like which one's like hitting first. This is not, like the, like the best benchmark that I could run. This is not being like, oh, Capra's faster than Snort or anything like that. Um, but it is just kind of interesting to, to see that there's some like really interesting lag with the Snort one. Um, so let's go to the next, oh, dang it. My slide. Do you have any idea why that lag would be happening? Uh, not off the top of my head. Snort. How do I go? <laughs> That's a super slow. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, so uh, I said that we're gonna also do this kind of same thing in Go. Go is a little different. Go is a compiled language. So I'm not gonna have the same sort of like dynamic interaction that I'm gonna get with Ruby, um, but I can kind of ad hoc that on, interestingly enough, uh, by just adding JavaScript in there. So like what kind of hell did I put myself in? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm actually, uh, this is inspired by BetterCap. Uh, BetterCap uh, has this really fantastic um, uh, HTTP and HTTPS proxy that uh, you can use when you're man in the middle and clients on your network. And the way that you can write uh, these proxy uh, interactions, you just literally use JavaScript. And uh, essentially, you, this on, on load and on data are just these uh, special function names that BetterCap will look at in your uh, JavaScript file that you give to it. And based on that, it'll do, when it's loaded, it'll do the onload, and then for each uh, uh, request that it sees through its proxy, it'll do something on the data. So I wanna do something kind of similar, but I wanna do this for all types of packets that I see in my IDS. And so uh, the way that that works, by the way, is you use a package called auto, and auto basically you know, puts JavaScript uh, interpreter in your Go. It uses a uh, 
JavaScript interpreter that's written in Go, so you can just like basically put it in um, and just like run JavaScript and get the values out. And it's really interesting. So I'm gonna use that. But first, I have to make that packet information, which is just like that slice of data, right, that slice of U and eight integers, usable inside of auto, which is gonna be JavaScript, right? So very naturally, I go to JSON, which is the J J uh, JavaScript object notation or whatever. And how do I get that packet to JSON? Like what is the, the special sauce, the special magic here? How much code do I have to write? Oh, if you're not familiar with JSON, it's just like key value pairing and the values can be more JSON um, or an array, which is just JSON. So this is the code that you have to write in order to actually get the packet from the Go packet type, which is like the, the type that it sees a packet as in, in uh, the Go packet library. And I'm gonna put it into this dump layer, which is gonna have the name of the layer, the info, which is gonna be the actual just contents of the Go packet layer. So uh, I have the packet to JSON, takes in the packet, returns a string, which is gonna be the JSON string, and then an error if something goes wrong. And then it's gonna turn that into this. So we're gonna have the name, ethernet, uh, we're gonna have IPv4, for example, and TCP, and then the info is gonna be all the packet stuff, right? Uh, I don't actually go into like each line of that because I figured that'd be relatively boring, but hopefully you get the idea that it just takes it and puts it into that format. Uh, and then this is the basic gist of how I actually use it. I create a new VM using auto, which is gonna be the virtual machine to run the JavaScript code. And then I'm gonna pass in this case uh, a hard-coded variable, which is just gonna console log and then I'm gonna do something kinda of interesting, I'm gonna do JSON stringify on the packet, um, which is basically just gonna print out the packet as JSON uh, using JavaScript. I'm gonna create an inactive handler, uh, so libpcap has the concept of an active handler, uh, which is just something that starts listening on for packets right away, and an inactive handler, which is gonna allow me to actually like create uh, like a handler, which is gonna be a packet capture that's customized to my type before it starts even listening on, uh, for packets. Um, so what I do is I just ignore that and I make it active. And then I go ahead and I can create a packet decoder of type ethernet. And then I actually make a packet source, which I pass in the handler and the decoder. So it takes packets and decodes them with that type, or the, that uh, decoder. And then I'm gonna create this uh, global variable, which is gonna be the packet. So uh, this is a trick that I need to do in order to add custom functions to auto later that can deal with that packet. So I basically make it in kind of a way a global variable. And I can show you what I'm gonna do with that in a little bit. But for each packet that I get from the source, I'm gonna take the packet, turn it into JSON, set the packet in the VM, so the variable is gonna have this packet JSON string, and then I'm gonna parse the packet inside of the JavaScript. I have to do this in order to make it a usable object in the VM. I can't just pass in uh, the, the JSON string. Uh, at least in, in the case of, of this, I actually have to uh, parse it out. Now, I'm gonna run the code that I set up before, which is just literally gonna print it out to the screen, otherwise I'm gonna panic. And that's, and that's like literally like the gist of how I build roughly the same thing I would in PacketGen, but uh, using Go Packet. And I create these custom functions in Go that are gonna be usable from JavaScript, um, which is gonna allow me to do certain things. Like I can check if the packet contains uh, a layer. So this is gonna be uh, just a function that takes in one argument, which is just gonna literally check if uh, that string argument is ever matching any of these layer type strings, essentially. And if it is, then I can return a value true. Otherwise, I'm gonna return a false value. And so this is kind of weird, right? Especially if you've never been like, exposed to anything like this before. But again, it's just Go code that's gonna be exposed to my JavaScript code because the Go interpreter is, uh, the JavaScript interpreter is written in Go. So I can just basically call it to Go to do stuff in Go at any time. And then I can register that function inside of the JavaScript VM using that VM.set, right? Pass in the uh, function name, and then I actually pass in the function. And these are the same name, just because it makes it easier in my opinion, to kind of logically understand. Then we have uh, the same thing, but we, instead of checking if it contains the layer, I provide you the index of the layer. Because if I showed you before, right, it's a JavaScript, uh, uh, it's taking the pack and turning it into JavaScript, but that JavaScript is just literally an array that contains a bunch of just uh, key value pairings inside of it. So which layer, like what index of that array is the, you know, the zeroth, the first, the second, that contains the layer that I'm interested with. So I can quickly provide a syntactic sugar to my JavaScript code just by getting the layer index inside of Go instead. 
And then just with those two functions, I can do some like pretty powerful stuff. I can check if the con uh, contains layer TCP. I can then grab the IPv4 info and the TCP info of that packet um, using the layer index function. And then I can just console log the source IP, the source port, the destination IP, and the destination port that's all available to me right away. Which is just, I think, really nice that those two functions are the only two things you really need. You don't even need the layer index one or even the contains layer one, but these two functions provide a really nice uh, tooling out of the box, or uh, basically out of the box. And then same thing uh, for UDP. Obviously, I just changed TCP and UDP and then added UDP source port and destination port, uh, but it's very similar. And I actually also released this as a tool uh, called NIDS, Network Intrusion Detection System. Uh, you know, written in Go, supporting rules, written in JavaScript. Fun fact, I released Capra, which is the IDS written in Ruby, and it got 10 stars, like, right away. No one starred NIDS. No one. <laughs> but NIDS is really cool, because it's going to actually uh, support uh, environments um, uh, like, like Windows much better uh, than the Ruby one, because uh, Ruby PCAP doesn't really support Windows using the NPCAP, but GoPack it does. And so uh, this one's actually like a better tool to use in a lot of cases. But, uh, and it has, again, like a weird property, right? Because I'm having to deal with this whole like Go and JavaScript thing. What I have is I have a setup rules file, which you can use to actually start um, providing the VM with a whole bunch of perhaps custom functions that you want um, without having to set them every single time in the packet loop. So uh, this is like how you could use it. So you could create a you know, setup rules file where it has a blacklist, which is an array that contains these IP address strings that I don't want to talk to for some reason. And then I can then have a function that goes through the blacklist and then checks if that uh, is contained in there, right? And then you can have a rules file and then this is gonna be actually run for each packet that it sees in that packet source loop. And then uh, it's literally just gonna check if that IPv4 destination IP is in a blacklist. And then if you run it at the command line, uh, you can see it if you start pinging 8.8.8 .8 or 1.1.1. Uh, oh yeah, so the setup rules file, I just kind of went through without it zooming in or not. <laughs> um, and then again, so you run it at the command line. Uh, just kind of interestingly, uh, I don't have like a syntactic sugar to set the interface. Uh, unlike like in the Capra version, but I do have a command line flag to do this. Um, this is just because just I literally didn't get around to it. Uh, but you could, if you ever wanted to, you could just use another command line tool and just like, you know, call it inside that when you're setting it up. So just kind of a weird point. Um, the immediate flag is probably what you want to set if you ever wanted to use NIDS, because by default, libpcap has a buffer and it'll add a bunch of packets to that buffer. And so you won't see like the rules evaluate right away. It'll wait till the buffer is full. Um, so you can set immediate, which is just a libpcat flag, to say, I want to start evaluating stuff right away. Screw the buffer. So I showed you like these very traditional ways of like setting up these IDS. And it's not that you're always going to have this. You can imagine this as one host, and then we have just one network interface, which probably isn't true. And then we have two processes. We have a lot more processes on a host. But the network interface, you know, passes the packet to both these things that are listening on it, and then it does something on the IDS level, right? where uh, you have like these two things that are just kind of separate. Um, wh what if I were to just kind of just put the IDS in the web server? And this is just kind of weird. But what's very nice about this is that if you remember me saying I wasn't gonna really do TCP stream reassembly, I could have the whole operating system do that for me or have the programming language manage that for me essentially um, by just like putting my IDS code right where it matters. So if I only have a web server running on this thing, why well, have a totally separate process doing this when I could, in theory, just literally like man in the middle of the request before it even like hits the client. So you could write like arbitrary functions like you know, analyze the request. And this is a very like, like this, this isn't actually gonna catch anything, but you can specify in a whitelist manner how you want people to interact with your application. And I've seen this like uh, be very good at catching things. Um, just for an example, like if you run like Nikto on a web server like this, uh, you can like, like catch basically everything because it's gonna do all a bunch of weird stuff. It's gonna do anomaly like stuff on your application. So if you set up a whitelist kind of uh, uh, application parameters in the application itself, you get a whole bunch of benefits, especially not even having to do things like uh, SSL uh, termination. Like if you've ever had to manage that kind of stuff, uh, if it was just in the, in the application itself, it is doing like the SSL decryption in the application. Obviously, 
this gets into a weird point where we're gonna talk about like latency, where this is gonna add too much latency on to my clients or something like that. That's totally fair, 100% fair. But if you keep it light, you keep it into that whitelist uh, form, you can create a pretty small function that's gonna stop a whole bunch of things, uh, especially if you don't want them. Um, so, so how do I use that, for example, so I can register a web server with this handle func that with the default path, so whenever you hit this web server for whatever it is, I'm gonna run that request through that analyze request function that I showed you before. If I get an error, I'm gonna print the error to the screen. Otherwise, I'm gonna say hello, whatever the remote address was. And so I can start the actual server with that HTTP listen and serve, and it's just gonna listen on all the interfaces on 8080. So if I were to run that, and then I were to start hitting that with my web browser, or with curl, I'm not gonna get anything from the, the actual uh, web server. It's just gonna cut my connection out, and I'm gonna be able to log whatever happened onto the screen. So I can see that I tried to hit it with my uh, Mac OS Chrome client, and it denied that because uh, it didn't actually uh, provide the content type that it, I wanted. I wanted only application JSON, but my Chrome client said I want, I could have image web, I can have like, XML, HTTP, all this other stuff. Um, so you'd have to like tune it to like what you think normal traffic is like. So, um, and then if I just hit it with like these weird paths, I'm gonna say this path doesn't exist, et cetera, and I'm using curl for that. Um, maybe you don't want to blacklist curl, but maybe you do, I don't know. So, uh, network interface, what if I also, instead of putting it in the web server, I could also put it in the web browser, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Like this is like totally un uh, not very traditional IDS setups. Um, what gets kind of interesting is that just like in my Chrome, like, uh, or in my Firefox browser, I can create custom plugins that can uh, check all of the requests as they're happening or right before they happen. Um, so for example, uh, this is an on before request listener that uh, will block the request and I can choose whether or not I actually want to stop the request. Um, and I can also have access to the request body and this will happen for all URLs. So basically I'm just checking uh, if the URL, uh, the function details, it has a JavaScript object that it knows, like you're, you're trying to hit a URL, it's coming from the, the main frame or it's coming initiated by this other website and those details are passed to the function. I can grab the URL from that and parse it and then I can check if the details contains, uh, it's not mainframe and it's trying to talk to my local host, then a website is trying to talk to my local host. Um, like the website initiated it. So this is, for example, the exact like boom, uh, Zoom vulnerability uh, for Mac OS, where I go to a website, the website's like, oh cool, let me talk to your local host, but I'm gonna grab uh, an image to try to get around uh, browser policies. This would totally thwart that if I were to add a cancel true into here. Um, and I actually literally wrote a Chrome plugin that does almost like this exact same thing, um, but it actually just denies all local host traffic entirely. Uh, and then I have a whitelist, which is google.com, github.com, and twitter.com, and I literally just check if that URL uh, is, that URL host name uh, is in that whitelist. So the URL host name will be like the, the whole subdomain thing too. So it'll be, if I hit like github.com, maybe I'm gonna go grab something from like live.github.com or something like that. That'll all be warned on the console because I'm not explicitly whitelisting these things. And so it's just in like uh, the background page of that uh, actual um, a plugin, you would see all these warnings. So for, even for example, when you go to the Chrome extension part, that's a URL that the Chrome browser can see. So if you want to catch even those kinds of things, this is like a really fantastic thing that you're not gonna catch with your network IDS. You can't, it doesn't see it. So um, really interesting kind of functionality when you think about deploying them in like kind of non-traditional senses, not relying specifically on libpcap, but just relying on like, well, the web server can see the request, of course it can or the web browser can see the request, of course it can, and it does all the TLS like decrypting for you. You don't, you don't have anything hidden. Like, and I don't even have to just console this to like some like screen somewhere. I can send this out somewhere. I can like log it and do a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. And you'll catch like really interesting traffic this way. Um, and I have a uh, Chrome, uh, Chrome plugin that does this all the time, and I catch a whole bunch of interesting stuff um, that I not write other plugins to block. And then, that's all I have. <laughs> so I got a question for you. So yeah. With the new Google Manifest 3.0, yeah. uh, how does that impact? So Manifest 3, I'm very aware of the uh, like problem where essentially they're gonna do this declarative web request API. So the declarative web request API is supposed to in theory make things faster. But as like uBlock Origin, uh, the uBlock Origin developer found out like, well I can't do a lot of like the interesting uh, 
checking that I would be able to with a non-declarative web request API, the like web request API we all have right now. I'm, I'm, it hasn't been actually finalized. The manifest 3.0, uh, like it's just a document right now. It actually hasn't been finalized and it's getting a lot of pushback from the community. So if you guys don't want that functionality to go away, um, not to say go yell at Google, but complain, switch to Firefox. Firefox probably won't uh, lose that. Um, it's, it is a problem, and that would totally get in the way of some of the stuff that I'm doing, 100%. Yeah. So, so the manifest uh, alters the way that the ad blocker would work in Firefox, so you would be able to catch the request before it goes out. Which? Well, you would be able to catch the request before it goes out, but I can't do deny a dynamic rule interaction. So what I can do is I can specify URLs, and those URLs, which is like limited to 10,000 URLs, is those will be blocked. But they can have like special like patterns like stars to be able to catch like subdomains and stuff. Um, it, is a, it is a problem. Yeah. And it gets something I'm very sad about because I'm, I'm a big fan of Chrome, but. I mean, a company that their business line is ads is wanting to allow ads, I'm, you know, shocked. Definitely. <laughs> And so you, it definitely requires like different like uh, layers of defense on, in your stack. So like setting up like a Raspberry uh, Pi hole at home, for example, yeah. that can help with some of that when your browser can't get in the way. But until then, you can do it. <laughs> also, I think they're going to keep it for their enterprise users or something like that. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. So pay them money, and that'll help you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming out. Because you guys that I just like love doing this stuff because I really do enjoy sharing it. So thank you. Thank you.